Welcome to a brand new series of Bible studies from the book of Philippians titled Real Christianity or Living the Christian Life at Its Best. The book of Philippians summarizes the great themes of Christian living. It points out that in Christ there is joy. In chapter one, there's joy in trials. In chapter two, there's joy in humility. In chapter three, there's joy in surrender. And in chapter four, there's joy when we have a grateful heart. But before we jump right into our study of the book of Philippians, and I hope you won't miss one of these studies. It'll, they will enhance your Christian life, give you a deeper experience with God. They'll encourage you in the trials of life. They will challenge you and lead you deeper into an experience with our Lord. But before we jump right into Philippians, we need a little background. And so let's do that. But before we do, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity of studying your word. As we study your word, open our hearts, open our minds, give to us a sense of your presence. Speak to us, lead us to greater faith, to a deeper experience with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some experiences in life that you never forget. I was flying back from Brazil to Washington, D.C. And just before the plane had to land, the pilot came on, as he often does, and says, we're going to be landing in about 30 minutes. And if anybody needs to get up, use the bathroom, walk around, this is the time to do that, because very soon I'll put the seatbelt on. I got up and went into the bathroom, and I knew something was wrong because when I shut the door behind me in the bathroom, the lights went out, it was dark, and the door locked and I couldn't open it. Well, you know, I'm about six foot one, and in those small bathrooms, I'm always crowded anyway, and I just thought to myself, it's dark, the plane's landing, I got to get out of here. So I, I tried to push the lock and jam the lock open, couldn't do it. Uh, so I thought, man, I'll, I'll just sit and put the top down on the commode and I'll sit here and put my feet against the door. Couldn't get it open. Began to bang on the door. Pilot came on with an announcement. We'll be landing soon. And all I could imagine was landing, no seatbelt on, hitting a bump, hitting my head on that ceiling and breaking my neck. So I just kept pounding on the door, pounding on the door. And finally, finally, I put my feet on the door and got it open a crack and a flight attendant was passing by and I said, I'm locked in here, help me. She said, no, no problem, sir, no problem. And you know, there's a little key they have on the outside, the top of the door that they can open. She finally opened the door. Shut doors are no fun. When you're locked in the dark, it is no fun. You know, the apostle Paul experienced in his life some shut doors, but here is an eternal truth. God never shuts a door in your life without, without opening a larger door. Let's go to Acts, the 16th chapter. In it, we get the background of Philippi. Now, Philippi was a very wealthy city because they had discovered gold in the Pagonian Hills. Philippi is in the country of Greece. It's in Macedonia. The city was named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip, and it had been conquered later by the Romans. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, Mark Antony and Octavian came to Philippi and fought Brutus, conquered that city. It eventually became a very important city in that part of the Roman Empire. It was connected by the Ignatian Way from Rome to Philippi. Philippi is about seven miles from the beautiful seacoast city of Kavala, Neapolis today, in those days. And um, it is just a beautiful setting. It's there in the a little valley the mountains surround it, the sea breezes blow through. It had a population of about 2,000 people. Because it was so wealthy, it was designated as a retirement center for Roman soldiers. 
The Apostle Paul ministered there, but let's get back to that shut door. Acts, 16th chapter. The Bible says, Acts 16, verse 6, Now when they had gone through Pergia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now here's Paul. He said, God, I know what you want me to do. Lord, you want me to preach the word of God in Galatia. I know you do, Lord. And the door is shut right in his face. The Bible says the Holy Spirit forbids him. So then Paul says, verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia. Lord, maybe maybe it's, 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 not, it's uh, not Galatia, but maybe it's Bithynia. Look at verse 7. But the Spirit did not permit them. So here Paul believes he's doing God's will, believes he is in the very center of what God wants him to do, but yet the door is shut in his face once, shut in his face twice. Now, if you were Paul, how would you have felt? Would you have said, God, look, I'm trying to do your will, and everything I, I, I try to do, the door is shut right in my face. Have you ever had doors shut in your face? Maybe there was a job that you wanted, that you needed to support your family, and you applied and the door was shut right in your face and you didn't get it. Maybe there was a home that you wanted to buy and you dreamed about it. You drove by it. It, it was ideal for your family, but the door was shut in your face. Somebody else bought it a day before you were going to put in your offer. Maybe there was a relationship that you cherished, someone you loved, and the door was shut in your face. Either there was a divorce or that person uh, did not uh, desire the relationship. So we all experience in our life shut doors. We all experience in our life things that we think that the Lord wants us, but the door is shut. But here is the tremendous good news. One of the things we learn about Philippi in Acts the 16th chapter is that if God shuts a door in our face, he's going to open a larger door. He did that for the Apostle Paul. Acts 16th chapter, looking there at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord calls us, called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul is in Troas. He's in Asia. He has a dream. And there is, he see, looks across the bay to Macedonia, northern Greece, and he sees the vision of the possibility of reaching Europe with the gospel. God shut a door on a city so called Paul could reach a continent. God shut a door on a province so Paul could reach the entire nation of Greece and also the continent of Europe. God is so amazing. You may be going through a trial right now. You may be going through real difficulty. You may be going through a heartache. There may be shut doors all around you, things you wanted to do, but you cannot do. You're confined with sickness or suffering or some other heartache, but God's gonna open a door for you. God's gonna open a door for you. You know, in the book of Revelation, chapter three, it talks about the God of the open door. He's not the God of the shut door. Look, verse Revelation 3, last part of verse 7. These things say he who is holy, who is true. He who has the key of David. You know, when I was locked in that restroom on that airplane, I was thankful somebody had the key to open the door. I was thankful to get out of there, that situation. But here is one, the divine Christ who has the key of David, the messianic promise, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. God has opened a door of salvation for you. And with that door of salvation, forgiveness in Christ, freedom from guilt in Christ, no more condemnation in Christ, new power in Christ, new strength in Christ, strength for our weakness, wisdom for our ignorance. Christ has opened the door for you. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. And because of that, we can rejoice. God is not the God of the shut door. God is the God of the open door. So Paul, 
sensitive to the spirit responds to the call of God and he leaves Asia and goes to Greece. And the Bible says, therefore sailing from Troas, Acts 16, verse 11, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and the next day to Neapolis, that seaport coast city. I've been in Neapolis today, it's called Kavala many times, walked along the shore, sat on the rocks, looked out at the sea and tried to imagine the Apostle Paul coming there, not far from the center of Neapolis or Kavala today, just up the hill a little bit, there's a monument to the Apostle Paul and kind of a facade that uh, tells the story of his landing there. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia colony, we stayed in the city for some days. Why did Paul stay in the city for some days? The reason he stayed there is this because he wanted to evaluate the city. He wanted to get to know the people. He walked up and down the streets. He was not a goof. If you want to make an impact for Christ, if you want to be the light of the world in the darkness, if that indeed is your desire, come in contact with people. Go to the marketplaces. Visit their places of entertainment. Of course, godly entertainment. <laughs> You're not going to be visiting bars and some of these lewd movie theaters, obviously. But you want to go where people are. That's the point. Touch them with the grace and the love of goodness of God. Now, the Bible says, On the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customly made. And we sat down there and spoke to the woman who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God, and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So who is Lydia? Lydia comes from Asia. She's a very wise businesswoman, and she comes from Thyatira. And uh, what has brought her to this Roman city of Philippi? What's brought her there is business, because Philippi's at the end of the Ignatian Way. It's a very wealthy city. The Romans were crazy about Roman togas, and they loved these purple togas. Lydia, the Bible says here, was a seller of purple. What, what's, what do you mean a seller of purple? Well, purple comes from a mollusk, and you take these shells, these mollusks, and you boil them. And when you boil the mollusk shells, the little animal inside, of course, dies, but it lets off a purple dye, D-Y-E, a purple dye. And then you take that purple dye and you prepare it so that you can dye the togas purple. And Lydia knew that Philippi was a very wealthy city because of the money that it had made from the Pagonian hills and the sale of gold. She also knew that it was at the end of the Ignatian Way and many travelers came to that city from Rome. And they brought goods to the city, but they purchased goods from the city to bring back throughout the Roman Empire. So she was very aspiring. As a Jewish woman, she came to uh, the city of Philippi, but there was not one Jewish synagogue in Philippi. How do we know that? It takes 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. And Lydia could not find a synagogue, so she went out by the riverside, faithful to God, to worship. And there were a small group of women with her. Paul learned that she was there and went out and sat down and began sharing Jesus with her. She began sharing Christ with her, began sharing about his goodness and his grace. Not long ago, I was at uh, Philippi, and uh, while I was there, I had a group, and we were sitting around on a little, in a little amphitheater. Behind me was the brook that uh, would have been there in Lydia's day, a place where she would have been baptized. And as I was talking to our group, a group of young people came. And they gathered around there, and I began to think, this is my opportunity to share Jesus. And there must have been 20, 25 of these young people, and they all sat down. And I welcomed them. Thank you so much for joining us. And began to talk about the story of Lydia, 
and how her heart was so open to Christ and how the only way we can find peace, the only way we can find meaning, the only way we can find purpose in life is through Jesus. Lydia that day accepted Christ. And as she accepted Jesus on that Sabbath day, the Bible says, verse 15, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she constrained us. So imagine if Paul, Silas, Timothy, he, Paul and his evangelistic team, and Luke go to this very wealthy woman's house on Philippi, and you have the first house church established by this first convert there. God shut a door in Asia because he wanted to open a door in Europe. When God shuts a door in your life, he is going to open a door. Paul then began to preach throughout Philippi. And as he did, there was a young slave girl. And this young slave girl was possessed with demons. She was a kind of a psychic fortune teller. And she'd march in front of Paul and she'd cry out as she marched in front of Paul, these men are the men of God, listen to them. You know, I've done evangelism all over the world, and I don't think I'd like a demon-possessed slave girl coming, advertising my meeting, saying, come here, Pastor Philly, preach, you know, he's going to preach the words of truth. <laughs> Look what happens. You know, sometimes I think the Bible makes you smile, and this certainly does. Uh, Acts 16, verse 16. Now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling this girl followed paul and us this is luke speaking and cried out these men are servants of the most high god who claim to us the way of salvation she did this for many days and paul greatly annoyed <laughs> i can almost imagine paul i love that expression paul greatly annoyed he said look i've, I've had enough of this no more and he speaks by the name of jesus christ come out of her and the demon leaves her and the woman falls with peace and joy, freedom in Christ. Jesus sets us free. He sets us free from the demons that haunt us. He sets us free from greed and lust and materialism and struggles for power. Christ sets us free. And so this woman is set free. But when she's set free, she changes. See, we come to Jesus just like we are, this woman did. But you don't stay like we are. It's not love Jesus and do whatever you please. It's love Jesus and do whatever he pleases. So she comes to Jesus. But once she comes to Jesus and she is changed, she's no longer practicing the occult arts of divination. She's no longer doing her incantations. She's no longer a psychic seer. She now is a daughter of Christ. Now the wealthy merchants of Philippi are distressed. Why are they so distressed? What troubles them so much? They're not making money. See, some people sell their souls for money. Some people will be dishonest to make an extra dollar. Some people will use underhanded methods to take advantage of other people just to make money. And so here, they are distressed. And so they go to the authorities, and Paul and Silas are beaten. The Bible tells us about how the multitude comes against them, tears off their clothes, beats them with rods, throws them into the inner prison. <clears throat> now, that's interesting, the inner prison. I've been to Philippi many times, and the area that we believe that that prison is in has a little outer chamber and an inner prison. Now, the, in the inner prison, it's dark, it's damp, it's dirty. There is no light that comes through any window in that prison. So Paul and Silas are beaten with rods. Now, typically, those rods would be about a three-foot-long stick, like round stick, with leather attached to the end of it with little metal jagged pieces. So when you're whipped, they snap that whip, wrap it around your stomach, pull it back and pull out hunks of flesh. 
That's one way of whipping. The other way, sometimes you'd have a long rod with um, some carved out edges on it and you hit and you hit and you hit. That rod would typically be more breaking the bones. Paul and Silas were thrown into that dark, damp, dingy, dirty, filthy dungeon. They had been beaten. They were bruised and bodies broken and, and bloody. And there they're put in stocks. Now, what are stocks? You put your hand through and they fasten your hands in these stocks. They're like a wooden shelf that is half cut that comes down from the top and a wooden shelf that's half cut that comes up in the bottom. And so your hands are through, they're very uncomfortable. Your feet and hands are in these stocks. Now, surprisingly enough, something amazing happened. And I want to give you the formula for a miracle. If you need a miracle in your life, if you need to see God working in your life, here's the formula for a miracle. Need plus praise plus faith, plus prayer equals a miracle. Let me say it again. God works a miracle where there is a need. Where there is no need for a miracle, there is no miracle. So first need, plus praise, plus faith, believing that God's going to do something, plus prayer, that equals a miracle. So Paul and Silas are in prison. Verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I mean, these prisoners must have been amazed. Here, Paul's body broken, bruised, bloody. Here, they're in stocks. They're so uncomfortable. They have been thrown into this dark, damp dungeon, and they're singing praises to God. They have a need. They sing praises to God. They pray. They believe in what happens. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. The keeper of the prison sees what's going on. He sees that the prison has collapsed in this earthquake. He thinks the prisoners must have fled. And he knows that if they have fled, he will have to surrender his life. Because as a prison guard, you are responsible for the prisoners. And if they get away, your life is over. It's curtains. You know, you're, you're done for. Paul says, don't harm yourself, sir. We are all here. The prison guard approaches Paul. And Paul says to this Roman prisoner, he comes in. Then he called, verse 29, for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He cries out, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in all your household. In other words, your impact for Christ is going to ripple through your house and they too will accept Jesus. And that very night, that Roman jailer is saved by God's grace. You see, to be saved doesn't take years, months, days. Maybe you are tuning in to this broadcast and you've never fully given your life to Christ and Jesus speaks to you right now this can be your life-changing moment that Philippian jailer was changed that day now I want you to imagine the first church in Europe there's a wealthy woman from Asia by the name of Lydia there's a poor slave girl, possibly from Africa. There is a middle-class Roman centurion. Think of how different each of these individuals were, but they meet together in loving fellowship in Lydia's house. That's what the church is all about. The church is for all of us. Remember what Jesus said before end time, Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness for all nations. Then the end will come. And in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, verse 7, the scripture says, And I saw another angel fly in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. 
give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of the waters. See, the gospel is for all of us. It's not just for a select few of elite super Christians. It's for all of us. It's for the Lydia's of our day, the smart, intelligent businesswomen who are making good money and who use it for the cause of God and who open their homes to preachers to come to share the word of God. It's for little slave girls who have nothing in life but when they find Jesus, they have everything in life. They have the pearl of great price. It's for middle-class Europeans who need a change, a dramatic change in their life. You see, the gospel is for all of us. What are the lessons that we learn from this first study in Philippians? As we look at the history of the city, the first lesson we learn is this. When God shuts a door in your life, he's going to open another one. Look for the open door. The Apostle Paul was constantly looking for open doors. You remember what it says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3? Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to preach the mystery of Christ for which I also am in chains. We're going to study about this more a little later because when Paul wrote Philippians, he wrote it likely from Rome to the church at Philippi while Paul was in chains. And Paul says, pray that God's going to open the door for me even when I'm in prison in chains. Look for the open door. Satan may try to shut doors in your life. Satan might try to bring darkness upon you, discouragement upon you, disappointment upon you. But look for the open door. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two. God has people who he is preparing in varying circumstances of life. Wherever you are in life, God can reach you. He reached a woman called Lydia, businesswoman, when she was in prayer out by the riverside. Sometimes when we're in prayer, God comes close. He speaks to our hearts. He reached a slave girl when she was in the streets, desperate. Sometimes God reaches us in the streets. He reached a Roman centurion. Well, that Roman centurion was about his day's work. Whoever you are, Wherever you are, whatever the circumstances of your life, God can speak to you. God can reach you where you are. First lesson, God's the God of the open door, not the shut door. Second lesson, God reaches us where we are and transforms our life. Third lesson, do you think that Lydia had the idea that day when she woke up that her whole life would be changed? Do you think that the slave girl that day got up in the morning and said, my whole life's going to be changed today? What about the Roman centurion? You think when he went to sleep that night with his family, he thought that that night his whole life would be changed? God shows up often when we don't expect it. He speaks to our hearts. The, every moment is sacred. This day, God is speaking to you. This day, God is touching, wants to touch your life. This day, God wants to change you. Here's our last lesson in our story. God works miracles for those that trust him. Formula for a miracle, what is it? It is, we have to have a need. Paul and Silas had a need, they were in prison. Backs bloodied, they had a need. Paul and Silas praised God in spite of the circumstances. Paul and Silas clung to the promises of God by faith. They believed he was going to work. Paul and Silas prayed. N need. What is a miracle? Need plus praise plus faith 
plus prayer equals a miracle. God's going to work a miracle in your life as you trust him. There is no need that he cannot satisfy. There is no problem too great for him to solve. There is no mountain in your life too large for him to enable you to climb. There is no difficulty in your life that he cannot unravel. Trust him today. Open your heart to him today and watch how he works in your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts for Jesus. We thank you for his grace, his goodness, his power. We thank you that you are the God of the open door, not the God of the shut door. And when doors seem to be shut, we pray thee that you would open them for us. Give us a sense of your presence. Help us to know that in every moment of life, you want to show up and speak to our hearts. But most of all, dear Father, help us to know that in times of need, you can meet those needs and you're still the miracle working God. And we thank you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.